Firstly, I wish to express my thankfulness to Metropolitan Ambrose, who kindly asked me not simply to share with you my thoughts and reflections on a given theme, but to open my heart and express my deepest feelings on the crucial topic of the very human nature and its tremendous potential to transform or even overcome itself. I would like to thank you also for honoring me today with your presence and for your readiness and openness to hear about such a complex subject. I have to acknowledge that it is a great challenge to try to share with you my thoughts about something most likely unknown to you, although I'm not familiar with your language, culture, way of thinking and living. I apologize for not being able to be with you and meet you in person. Unfortunately, unexpected last-minute church, church obligations made it impossible for me to participate in this symposium. However, I'm happy that at least I was given this opportunity by video communication to talk and come closer to you. I know that your country is small in size but has an important historical background. Its people gave birth to a unique civilization, cultivated rare virtues, were humiliated and glorified, and lately have essentially contrib contributed to the technological progress of the world. As I have read in books, I realize that Korea is a country with dignity and nobleness, and one can learn a great deal from its people. It is a country that at first sight is so different and so far away geographically from Greece, my own country. Greece is also rich in history and culture, with many physical beauties and renowned personalities. It gave birth to wise people and heroes, spiritual values, expressive poetry, and unique art. Greeks have greatly honored human nature, have shown respect to the human body, have disclosed the magnificence of the human soul and have revealed the potential of the human mind and spirit. Moreover, they have struggled hard in their quest for the divine world and the true God. They imagined God, approached him, questioned him, disregarded him and venerated him. They struggled with him. The search for God resulted in comprehending the notion of divinity and gradually in the revelation of his person. They tried to communicate with God and even more so to be united with him. Ultimately, through the experience of God's communion, they transcended the question of his existence. Christianity was born from the womb of Greek civilization the Bible was first written in the Greek language, as well as the inspiring writings of the wise fathers, as we call them, who coupled beauty with truth, teachings with experience, theory with actions, natural gifts with spiritual values, daily life with visions, extremity with measure, ascesis with transcendence, the human nature with the divine mystery. Greece is full of small chapels, revered saints, miracles, religious traditions and practices, local feasts, people whose entire life reveals the yearning for God. God who does not punish the evil and rewards the virtues, nor provides answers to questions, or serves human wills, or produces good people and imposes him on his own laws, Instead, he loves to be communed of, to grant life to men, and share his eternity and godliness. All this is not a mere sequence of nice words and wishful thinking, but a life's experience, even today, when everything seems to be fading away. Based on the above, I will elaborate on my own thoughts and ideas. <clears throat> the title of my talk includes two words. The first one, transhumanism, is unknown to me, and the second, theosis, 
I'm sure sounds strange to you. I read in the Wikipedia, transhumanism is an international and intellectual movement that aims to transform the human condition by developing and creating widely available sophisticated technologies to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical and psychological capacities. Transhumanist thinkers study the potential benefits and dangers of emerging technologies that could overcome fundamental human limitations as well as the ethics of using such technologies. The most common thesis is that human beings may eventually be able to transform themselves into different beings with abilities so greatly expanded from the natural condition as to merit the label of post-human beings. Despite my scientific and technological education and background, I must admit that I do not quite understand what exactly transhumanism is all about, nor what its purpose or necessity are. It transcends me. This is why I would like to listen and learn rather than talk about it. <clears throat> I understand that it promises technological enhancement of the intellectual capacity and physical strength to such a degree that not only will affect human identity, but also will entirely alter it. Its goal seems to be the creation of superhumans and posthumans. In a way, I can understand this, but I really don't believe in it. Do we really need this at present? Is it necessary? What is our final goal? What is the deeper reason for such an endeavor? Why try to create supermen instead of impro improving human beings as they are? Let me give an example. How can transhumanism solve the problem of poverty that afflicts our world or of wars and their destructive effects? A few months ago, United Nations announced that food worth $570 billion ends up in the waste dump every year, while this amount of food could feed 200 million people. Famine is a serious problem that has to and can be solved. The real problem is that it remains unsolved even though there is a solution. What is the point to create post-humans when we fail to help humans survive and improve their lives? Ultimately, what we should do is not to build a post-human being, but to restore today's humans that we have destroyed in many ways. Famine alleviation does not require ingenuity, specialized knowledge, or extreme power, or even more so, technological enhancement of human beings. Transhumanism seems entirely incapable to provide solutions to the perpetual problems of human life, such as war destructions, arms race, unequal distribution of wealth, drug use, mental disorders, broken human relations, personal drama, or even calamities and natural devastations. Could transhumanism eliminate death? Could it hear the self-destructiveness of human beings by creating our descendant whose artificial intelligence will be provident and protective of every kind of self-destruction? If this can be achieved by the post-human being, why not be also achieved by its creator? Perhaps the objective, the invention and creation of the post-human being, instead of solving the problems of modern man, may end up being itself its primary problem. What is the point of constructing a computer that can beat the world chess champion when we are unable to solve by ourselves our simple everyday problems? What is the point of transcending our physical limits when actually you are trapped in our senseless passions? 
How can one transcend oneself when he is unable to defeat it? These problems do not require exceptional intelligence. Extraordinary strength and advanced technology in order to be solved. These problems cannot be solved by superhumans, but by ethically enhanced human beings. Neither do, they, do the above questions need a supermind in order to be answered. What we need is wisdom, not intelligence, virtues, not strength, love, not the technology, not the enhanced human, but the humane human. Our aim is to become true human beings. It is not to transcend our nature by becoming non-human, non-humane superhumans. How graceful is man when he is a true man, writes Menander, a Greek ancient writer of the 4th century BC. I mentioned in the beginning that the title of my talk includes two words. The first one, transhumanism, is unknown to me. The second word, theosis, I believe is unknown to you. I will try to speak to you about the second word, for I believe it is the most precious legacy of the Orthodox Christian faith. Not as a teaching or a law to which we ought to conform, but as an exceptional potential that is hidden within every man. Theosis is not a state one can attain, but a gift granted from God. It is not given to those who try hard and follow certain guidelines and rules, but to those who have a pure and humble heart. Its primary aim is not self-transcendence, but freedom and spiritual fulfillment. I may disappoint you, because while transhumanism is very impressive, theosis seems to be neglected. Although it is very important and highly essential for everyone, our train of thought and course of life moves to the opposite direction. In any way, by speaking on theosis, I will try to transcend transhumanism. The Greek word theosis, coming from the word theos, God, means course towards God and communion with Him. Thus, the whole issue of transhumanism versus theosis comes down to the question of the existence of God. If God does not exist and the concept of divinity is meaningless, then theosis is totally abolished and transhumanism may be the best proof of human pettiness, loneliness, agony and tragedy, since it designates the perpetual effort of man through history to become godlike, namely to imitate something that does not exist. On the contrary, if God exists and can be communed of, then there is nothing greater than to be united with him, and nothing more senseless than transhumanism. The experience of theosis constitutes an undeniable ver verification of both the existence of God and the potential of man to commune with him. God exists and can be communed of. The title of my speech includes also the words versus, which implies comparison. I will not elaborate on this. The reason being that transhumanism and theosis can neither be compared, nor their possibilities and strength are in conflict. They are two entirely different things. Moreover, the term transcendence is not always appropriate when it refers to theosis. For instance, when it is used in the sense of abolishing human nature, as it applies to transhumanism. It can be used, though, in relation to theosis as a divine legacy and fulfillment of man's purpose, namely partaking of God's grace and energies without losing his human nature. As we mentioned above, a necessary prerequisite for better understanding the meaning of theosis is faith in God. By faith, I do not mean the acceptance of his existence, 
based on logical arguments and psychological needs, or on fears, or even social pressure, so as to acquire a, a religious identity. Instead, true faith is an inner belief in the exist on the existence of God, who is the highest being, the creator of the world, the cause of every good, the source of infinite wisdom. Yet, how can one acquire this kind of faith? In our days, this is not self-evident. The inconceivable progress of science and the vast range of technological applications gradually build up our self-confidence, which in turn weakens the need for God and strengthens the faith in human power, ingenuity, and skills. When this is combined with a life ruled by passions, it increases the questioning of true God and replaces the quest for divine power with a lifeless world randomness. We do not need God. We neither want him nor are we interested in him. We reject him. We are fed up with religion. This is the prevailing spirit of our era. In order for one to believe, one has to feel first the need and desire for God. Not because he feels small and weak, but because this is the only way to defeat his true great enemies, his ego and death. Thus, he will manage to free himself, to become whole, to surpass the limits of his biological life, of time and of his pettiness. When one has faith in God, he can understand the nature of beings and interpret the world, life and man in an entirely different way. The need for God generates the longing for him and the question of his existence is placed aside. Then follows the struggle to get to know God. Is he an abstract idea? Is he a high, higher power? Is he a mystery? Is he a person? Finally, what and who is the true God? And how can we approach him? Orthodox Christian faith teaches that God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ is the Son who became man so that man can become godlike by being in communion with God. The greatest privilege of man is not his ability to prove the existence of God, but his potential to experience his love and live in communion with him. The relationship of man with God can be divided in four stages. The first stage is the potential of man to constantly identify the presence of God in his life. This is the stage of faith. The second is the possibility to approach and become like him. This is the stage of purification. The third is to communicate with him through prayer. This is called illumination. And the fourth stage is to be united with him. This last stage is called communion between God and man. This is the stage of theosis, which is not a theoretical goal, but a true experience. Let us examine in detail what the state of theosis is. It is when God grants his grace namely his energies upon the soul of man, and thus he lives within him, he acts within him, and walks within him. Man is immersed in the ocean of the grace of God, enjoys divine love and strength, acquired, div acquires divine virtues and attributes, divine beauty, wisdom, and knowledge that cannot be explained rationally, joy, peace and love that are extraordinary and beyond what is humanly achievable. This state does not simply extend the limits of man, but in essence transcends them. It makes man a relative of God. In a way, man is transformed. 
he can see and comprehend what is invisible, what is above nature and beyond human reason and sense. As mentioned before, the question of the existence of God fades away. Instead of being answered theoretically and rationally, it is replaced by the experience of his grace and of his presence. When one has, has experienced communion with God, he does not need logical verification of his existence. The presence of God in our lives results in some special gifts such as insight, foresight, discernment, science, and miracles. Although man remains human and keeps the traits of his personality, he presents virtues and powers that not only are un uncommon but also divine. By subjecting his will, he identifies his volition with God's volition, his thought with God's mind, and can handle God's power. He exceeds time and thus can see other people's future. This is foresight. He meets you for the first time and knows your name and life history. This is insight. He reveals to you whatever is useful for your spiritual benefit. He may offer a cure to your incurable disease and do good to both your body and soul. He helps you fulfill your needs, which at times may be unknown to you. He reveals God to you and the course towards him and may influence the turn of events. All these occur in a very gentle and considerate way so that they do not appear as impressive achievements, satisfying curiosity and feeding human ego. Instead, they reveal the glory of God and verify his presence. Next to such a godly person, you cannot help confess that the Lord is alive. As a result, the entire image and interpretation of the world changes. You are no longer bothered by its imperfections, nor disappointed by its unknown secrets and incomprehensibility, because its reality is harmonized with its meaning and purpose. This is a state above and beyond nature. It is holiness and it is called theosis. <clears throat> All of the above can only be comprehended if we realize that man's destination is not his technological enhancement, but his sanctification, his union with God. His grandeur is not hidden behind what he can achieve, but behind what God's manifestation, but behind God's manifestation in him. Theosis is not the best approach to transcendence. It is the only approach to life. <clears throat> in the state of theosis, everything is overturned. The humble one is being exalted. The last becomes first. Death is life. The poor becomes rich. The one who is being persecuted is blessed. Our enemy becomes our benefactor. The one who has nothing possesses everything. The one who seems to be foolish or sick may be wise and strong. The slave is a free man. In order to enter in the realm of theosis, one has to deny himself and take up his cross. In order to save his life, he has to lose it, namely to sacrifice himself unto death. As stated above, the greatest enemies of man are his ego, death, and time. The ego gives birth to passions. Death generates fears, and time leads to a myopic perception and limited vision of life in general, and to the inability to enter in the depth of the mystery. The deified man is sanctified free from his passions, and lives eternity as of now. At this point, I would like to present two typical examples of such a sanctified life. 
The one is taken from the life of the most loved saint in Russia, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. A Russian by the name of Motovilov describes in his personal diary his meeting and conversation with Saint Seraphim. Their conversation was about the state of theosis, namely the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Having difficulty in understanding it, he writes the following. I do not understand how I can be certain that I am in the Spirit of God. How can I discern for myself his true manifestation in me? Then Father Seraphim took me very firmly by the shoulders and said, We are both in the Spirit of God now, my son. Why don't you look at me? I replied, I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing like, like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Father Seraph Seraphim said, Don't be alarmed, alarmed, your godliness. Now you, yourself, have become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the Spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, you would not be able to see me as I am. Then, bending his head towards me, he whispered softly in my ear, Thank the Lord God for his unutterable mercy to us. And only in my heart I prayed mentally to the, loved, to the Lord God and said within myself, Lord, grant him to see clearly with his bodily eyes your presence. And you see, my son, the Lord instantly fulfilled the humble prayer of poor Seraphim. After these words, I glanced at his face, and there came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of its midday rays, the face of a man talking to you. You see the movement of his leaves, lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice. You feel someone holding your shoulders. Yet you do not see his hands. You do not even see yourself or his, his figure, but only a blinding light spreading far around for several yards. How do you feel now? Father Seraphim asked me. I answered. I feel such calmness and peace in my soul that no words can express it. What else do you feel? An extraordinary joy in all my heart. This present joy, which now visits us, is little and briefly. What else do you feel, your godliness? I answered, an extraordinary warmth. We are sitting in the forest. It is winter out of doors, and snow is underfoot. There is more than an inch of snow on us, and the snowflakes are still falling. What warmth can there be? And the smell, he asked me. We are now enveloped in the fragrance of the Holy Spirit of God, and the warmth. By it, the hermits were kept warm and did not fear the winter frost being clad as in fur coats in the grace-given clothing woven by the Holy Spirit. When I left Father Seraphim, who was still in the same place where he had been at the beginning of our conversation, surrounded by the ineffable light that I had witnessed with my own eyes. Allow me to continue with a second example which refers to the writings of a contemporary Serbian saint who was persecuted, imprisoned, and badly tortured by the Germans in Dachau during World War II. This text is indicative of how a, a deified man experiences his relationship with his enemies and torturers. He writes, Bless my enemies, O Lord, even I bless them and do not curse them. 
enemies have driven me into your embrace more than friends have. Friends have bound me to earth, enemies have loosened me from earth and have demolished all my aspirations in the world. Enemies have made me a stranger in worldly realms and an extraneous inhabitant of the world. Just as a hunted animal finds safer shelter than an, un an unhunted animal does, so have I. Persecuted by the enemies, found the safest sanctuary, having ensconced myself beneath your tabernacle, where neither friends nor enemies can slay my soul. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even I bless them and do not curse them. They rather than I have confessed my sins before the world. They have punished me whenever I have hesitated to punish myself. They have tormented me whenever I have tried to flee torments. They have scolded me whenever I have flattered myself. They have spat upon me whenever I have filled myself with arrogance. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even I bless them and do not curse them. Whenever I have made myself wise, they have called me foolish. Whenever I have made myself mighty, they have mocked me as though I were a dwarf. Whenever I have wanted to lead people, they have shoved me into the background. Whenever I have rushed to enrich myself, they have prevented me with an iron hand. Whenever I thought that I, could, I would sleep peacefully, they have wakened me from sleep. Whenever I have tried to build a home for a long and tranquil life, they have demolished it and driven me out. Truly, enemies have cut me loose from the world and have stretched out my hands to the hem of your garment. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even I bless them and do not curse them. Bless them and multiply them. Multiply them and make them even more bitterly against me, so that my fleeing to you may have no return, so that all hope in men may be scattered like cobwebs, so that absolute serenity may begin to reign in my soul, so that my heart may become the grave of my two evil twins, arrogance and anger, so that I might amass all my treasure in heaven, or so that I may for once, I may for once be freed from self-deception, which has entangled me in the dreadful web of illusory life. Enemies have taught me to know what hardly anyone knows, that the person has no enemies in the world except himself. One hates his enemies only when he fails to realize that they are not enemies, but cruel friends. It is truly difficult for me to say who has done me more good and who has done me more evil in the world, friends or enemies. Therefore, bless, O Lord, both my friends and enemies. A slave curses enemies, for he does not understand, but a son blesses them, for he understands. For a son knows that his enemies cannot touch his life. Therefore, he freely steps among them and prays to God for them. And what is the way to Theosis? It is true that the world we live in, no matter how big it is, or how much variety, creativity, and beauty it reflects, it appears at times too tight and suffocating. Despite its enormous size, its limits are restricting. We enjoy this world without being able to interpret and understand its secret details and deeper reasons. Although our knowledge is growing, the realm of the unknown becomes greater and greater. Nature is incomprehensible. Only 4% of the universe is visible. The remaining is invisible. 23% is dark matter, a 
and 73% is dark energy. It is dark, but it exists. And all the more, it conceals the very secrets of the world. The natural world is unreachable and undefined. It is uncertain according to Heisenberg's principle, relative according to Einstein's theories, and discontinuous and quantized according to Planck's theory. Its laws in general cannot be interpreted. Space has many dimensions, and we only perceive three of them, as well as a fourth, as well as a fourth one, time. Under certain circumstances, length is contracted, whereas time is dilated. While it, all this can be proven, we cannot understand the reason why the world is made in this way. The same applies to its sizes, its dimensions, both in the macrocosm and in the microcosm. They are inconceivable. We can neither conceive the large dimension nor the small one. Within this world, we feel our limits. While we know a great deal, we do not comprehend everything. While we have a lot of power, we cannot do everything. While we have strong senses, we cannot see everything. We have very strong instruments to see what is visible, but we have no means to detect what is invisible. We have proofs, but not interpretations. Knowledge, but not understanding. Whatever we do, we feel that most of it surpasses our ability of our perception, our senses, and our strength. Although Einstein once said that the most incomprehensible thing in the world is that it is comprehensible, today we could say the exactly opposite. And even more so, that the most comprehensible thing in the world is that God is incomprehensible. This is the reason why man has an innate urge to exceed, exceed his limits and transcend his own nature. Ultimately, man does not feel confined because of his insufficient intelligence or limited strength. Thus, enhancing his intel intelligence or multiplying his strength is not the solution to his real problem. His freedom lies not in his physical or intellectual strength, but in his spiritual potential, not in his own power, but in the wisdom and power of God. Man should narrow, humble, and purify himself so that he can become receptive of the grace of God. Faith, purity, and humility is the, three is the only course to transcendence. Just as the atom, although so small, just one-tenth of a nanometer, stores enormous amount of energy within it, just as matter on the nanoscale presents rare qualities entirely unknown, just as the stars, when they shrink to become black holes, acquire an extremely strong gravitational field, so man gains greater strength and presents unique virtues when he decreases and humbles himself. The course of humility is a one-way road that leads to a different world, the world of truth, the world of God, the world of our union with him, the world of theosis. Every man has the potential to become deified. It is our greatest legacy and he has to make most of it. By his resurrection and ascension, Jesus Christ has already deified human nature and thus offers this potential to everyone. Likewise, theosis is not an individual experience, but is shared within the church by all faithful through their personal struggle to be united with God. The world of the senses, of logic, of human qualities and abilities, 
of everyday life resembles with a sphere in which man is restricted. Outside the sphere, there is the unknown. What transhumanism can ultimately do is to increase the radius of the sphere without necessarily putting in order what is inside it. Whereas, in the state of theosis, the spherical surface becomes transparent and permeable, transcendable. In this way, one can both know and experience the mystery of God. I thank you.